man, I'm going to tell you what, it is easy to follow in that, man, the depths of the Lord Jesus and who he is. Would you turn to Mark <clears throat> chapter 14 this morning? Mark chapter 14. As we continue to work through the book of Mark, hey, coming up really quickly on Christmas. And man, some of y'all are just now starting your Christmas shopping this week. Some of you have been doing it since like November 15th. We won't judge either one of you today, but Christmas is just such an incredible time. Uh, together with family, it's a time to make fun of the ones you love. Nat Milliken, I've never seen quite a suit like you had. Nat had this suit with all these lights on it. And it just so happens, two peas in a pod right here. Laura Lee at her house, we won't judge you for your Santa shrine thing you've got going on in your house. But uh, it's crazy the things that Christmas does and just the feelings uh, that come up in culture, in society. And a lot of them can be good, but I think one thing that I think really bothers me about it though is when we just slip into this pseudo sense of joy and this pseudo sense of merriness when we're not really delving down into the depths of exactly how big of a deal that this truly is. Something that doesn't end when the 25th changes to the 26th, but grips us to our faces, grips us in our souls as to who we are. And I love, I mentioned this last week, preaching through books of the Bible, because it's amazing the things that you come across at the times of the year, you'll come across them when you're preaching just through chapter by chapter. Here we are, Merry Christmas, but about to approach Mark 14, a chapter about betrayal, a chapter of rejection, a chapter of suffering. But before in any way we seem to think, man, that should take our joy. It is the suffering that we're gonna see in this text, which is why our joy is such so deep-rooted. Deep in chapter 14, <clears throat> in every single way, there's one clear thing, is that death is coming for Christ. In verses one and two, they're plotting his death. In verses three through nine, Jesus is being anointed for his burial. In verses 10 and 11, Judas is planning to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. In verses 12 through 25, the Lord's Supper is being instituted, which is going to be a memorial for what? The death of Jesus Christ. And then verses 26 through 31, Jesus predicts Peter's denial of him and says the shepherd is going to be struck. Jesus is going to die. And we come sandwiched in the middle of this chapter, I think, to one of the most moving passages in the entirety of any narrative in scripture. And it's the war of the Lord Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And I'm gonna tell you what, if we read this text and do not realize the gravity of incarnation that God became man, we've missed it. There's hard, you'd be hard pressed to find elsewhere in scripture a place where the humanity of Jesus Christ is more on display. The Isaiah 53, man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief, who has come to bear our sin than this text right here. And so if you would, in honor of God's word, would you stand as we read of the events in the Garden of Gethsemane, starting in verse 32. This is the word of the Lord. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Would you pray with me? Father, we have no business of speaking your name today. 
of taking your name on our lips, but we lift you up, God, and we ask by the power of your spirit, would you help us to feel the weight of the agony of the Son of God who has suffered that we might live, who's bore every burden, every sorrow in his body on our behalf. Lord, would you do this to lift up his name, that your, the cross would be lifted up today. And as we approach Christmas, we'd be amazed at one thing and that God would die for sinners. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want us to walk away with one really clear idea from this text. And I'm gonna steal this phrase from the book of Hebrews. Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Thus, we're going to explore him as the founder. And when I say the founder, I mean the establisher, the worker, the provider, the accomplisher of salvation. And man, we're gonna see it really clear in what he's doing in this garden of how he has done this work. But also with that, he's the perfecter. That we don't just come to Jesus and have salvation through his blood, through his sacrifice, that through his life, and especially events like his life in this garden, we see the pattern for what it means to live in victory by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so let's look at verses, starting 32. You pick up, it says, they go into a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed And troubled, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Where else do you see the emotions of the Lord Jesus like this? This is just not typical when we think of him. We think of strong, we think of the exalted, resurrected king, we think of a guy feeding the 5,000, doing miracles, walking on the water, but suffering like this in anguish and distress. I don't think it's what comes to our mind. In so much of the book of Mark, we've seen the deity of Jesus so clearly, which is so important. Because only if Jesus is in fact God, can he truly do as what he set out to do at the cross. Can he truly be savior? Before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah the prophet said that the Lord said, I'm the Lord and besides me there is no savior. Unless Jesus is God, he cannot be savior. And only can an infinitely, eternally holy God be satisfied by the wrath of an infinitely, eternally holy son, not by just any man. So the deity is important, but man, the humanity is clearly important similarly. And at the incarnation, this is what we celebrate. You have God coming as a man. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This great paradox, mystery, we're never gonna understand. Jesus, fully God, fully man. Jesus had to become a man according to Hebrews chapter two because he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he could be a fit substitute for sin. That unless Jesus is human, unless he is a man, he cannot, he cannot pick up where Adam left. He cannot live the life that we could never live. He can't die the death we deserve unless he truly is human. And do you think it's any mistake that the demise and the condemnation of men in the world came in a garden and you're about to see the victory accomplished in the prayers of Jesus in a garden coming to right get right what Adam got wrong so Jesus in his humanity it's so important we not neglect that or his deity we hold them together because in Jesus's humanity we see he can be a fit substitute but we also see that he can sympathize with our weaknesses now I don't mean in any way to say that anything Jesus experienced in this text, we could ever even get close to experiencing because we could not. This is a unique experience that could only have been endured and accomplished by him. But you all know in here, if there's one thing we can all agree on is we know what it means to be human. We know what it means to suffer. To have temptation that seems so overwhelming. This, I just can't, I can't get past that one. I can't beat it. The desire of my will is too strong to feel overwhelmed in temptation, to be overwhelmed in grief, to see a child, no matter all of your best efforts, a child in your household just rebelling. Like what is going on? To see suffering because of the loss of someone in your family, trying to endure that. 
to deal with things like the depression, to deal with anxieties of the world, to deal with worry and crazy amounts of emotional stress and trauma. To feel that to such a point where your chest feels like it's gonna cave in and you can just be thrust to the ground. But I wanna tell you, in the humanity of Jesus, no man, we have hope. In the humanity of Jesus, we have hope because you know in our lives, when we come to temptation, we'll go deeper and deeper and then we'll fail and we'll pick it up again. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and then we'll fail and we grow in likeness to him. But Jesus, as he's fighting this temptation in the garden, like he's fought his whole life, Jesus will go deeper and deeper and deeper down to the very deepest chasms of temptation and will never be overcome. And so what that means is for those who are his, there is no temptation that can overcome you that is not common to man, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That you cannot tread on by the power of the Son of God who has worked who what he has worked in this text. But also with this, we take great joy. When look at Hebrews 4, just to pull this idea out, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But listen to this. One who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus sympathizes with us in every way when it comes to temptation. And he sympathizes with us in every way, but much to a deeper level in all of our grief. There is no amount of sorrow. There is no amount of loss. There is no amount of sting of a betrayal of a friend or a spouse. There is no amount of burden in the Lord, in the world that the Lord Jesus has not bore fully in his body and put it to death. And man, we take joy from this today because hey, we can have a pseudo sense of joy at Christmas or we can have a one that is truly lasting in the person in the man of Jesus Christ. And we know in his humanity, you think we see in this text, my goodness, he can sympathize with us in our weakness, but we can never sympathize with him in the weakness that he is enduring here. This is something altogether different than we could ever come across. Why is Jesus in such a, I mean, Jesus is greatly distressed Troubled, he says, my soul is sorrowful unto death. Like my body could break for grief. What has gripped him so deeply that's evoking this response? Look at verses 35 and 36. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible from you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is experiencing such severe, immense trauma in his person that it has thrust him to the ground. I think we need to learn something here from Jesus in that if we have truly felt the weight of what it is to be human, at some point we're gonna be thrust to the ground in mercy only the Father can give. He's thrust to the ground. His physical response is so intense that in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, It says that his sweat became as great drops of blood in the garden. Now, some say that's metaphorical. But Luke, being a physician, many believe Jesus was encountering a literal medical condition called hematidrosis. Where under such immense weight and stress and fear and horror that his sympathetic nervous system is producing in him such a response that his capillaries in his skin have ruptured and he is perspiring blood. What is causing this? What is causing this? Verse 36, that he wants so desperately to pass, he says, all things are possible from you. Remove this cup. Remove this cup. This is what's causing this. It's this cup. What's in the cup? Many have asked this question over the years. What is in the cup that would have the Son of God in a position such as this? Is it the physical things that are to come his way? Is it the fact that Jesus is about to be betrayed, abandoned by all the ones he has loved most dearly? I don't think so. Is it because Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas? 
He's about to be tried falsely. He's about to be beaten and flogged. He's about to have the skin torn off his back by the Romans. Is it that? Is it the crucifixion? Is it they're gonna put a thorn, a crown of thorns on his head and he's gonna suffer and he's gonna be pinned to a cross. He's gonna be stuck with a spear. Those things are so clearly important to our faith because the New Testament, Testament chronicles them with great accuracy. But that's not the cup. That's not the cup. You know, many Christians over the years have suffered crucifixions. In Acts chapter five, the apostles get beaten by the religious leaders and they walk away literally like high-fiving each other that they were worthy to suffer for the name. So what is it in this cup that is so distressed the son of God where it seems in a point of hopelessness by all means? Listen to the Old Testament of the cup, Psalm 75, verse eight. For in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it. And listen to this. All the wicked of the earth, the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Jesus is not wicked. Jesus is the only righteous one. And this is the cup he's going to receive. Isaiah 51, 17. The Lord says, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. This is the most perplexing thing ever. The cup that Jesus is in such horror for is not physical. It's much worse than that. It's spiritual because it is the divine wrath of the Father. He knows the prophecy in Isaiah 53, written 700 years before his death, which said, it will please the Lord to crush him. He knows what he's about to endure. All the curses of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 28, all the curses for those who disobey the law, who have disobeyed the Ten Commandments are going to be leveraged fully on him. Every judgment against the wicked is going to be thrown down on him. Every injustice, every child who has been murdered, every case of abuse, every case of immorality is about to be with laser focus directed on the person of Jesus as if it were all his wickedness. This is the cross. This is what the Bible would call, which is a special word, and I pray we would never lose it, is propitiation. 1 John 2 2 says he is the propitiation for our sins and not our sins only, but the sins of the world. What is propitiation? Well, propitiation is the act where a God's wrath, where God's wrath is appeased, it's satisfied through sacrifice. And though this is the heaviest reality in the world, and this is the most dreary and hard and mournful type of reality that we're talking about right now, it's the most joyous in the world. And it is the glorious in the world. It's the majesty of Jesus that according to 2 Corinthians 5, he will on the cross literally become sin on our behalf. And the cup of God's wrath, he's going to drink it full. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Is that Jesus has bore our sins in his body on the tree. And so, oh man, I pray that we would never have Jesus died for my sin flippantly on our lips. And that when we think of the cross, we're not just thinking of Roman crucifixion. We're thinking of divine wrath being satisfied on our behalf. Oh man. Jesus, though, in verse 36, listen to what he says. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup. Listen to his words, though. Yet not what I will, but what you will. This is our salvation right here. Yet not what I will. So, hey, if you ever hear someone say, oh, well, it's not a prayer of faith, if someone says, oh, but what you will, Lord, well, you gotta take that up with Jesus when you see him. Because this is his prayer. You know what I think is implied in this text very clearly? 
Because the Father does not remove this corrupt, there is no other way to forgiveness of sins. There is no other way to salvation except if Jesus bears the sin of the world in his body as if he committed it. That's crazy. Oh, but man, oh, it's exciting. So how does he do this? How is he gonna get through this? And I would say how he's gonna get through this, the founder of our salvation, is he's gonna make war in a garden. He's gonna make war in this garden and he's gonna do it by prayer. Jesus is not duped by the, serenity, the seeming serenity, the seeming peacefulness, the seeming tranquility of the coolness of night like the disciples who've all fallen asleep. He's not duped by this because he knows there is something greater to be wrestled down in this garden and crushed and stamped on. Something that should have been stamped on thousands of years before. You know what I'm talking about? And so he comes in this text and makes war because he knows who his enemy is. You see, so often the case, we miss who our enemy is. We think it's our spouse when it's our sin. We think it's someone who does not know Jesus, that they're our enemy, when in fact it is their sin. It is the devil who is our enemy. We understand, we need to understand where war has to be fought, but so long in human history, we have 4,000 religions that try to tell us what we're trying to make war against, what we're trying to fix. At the beginning of World War I in 1914, World War I was kicked off and H.G. Wells began to write, great fiction writer, but wrote during World War I a series of articles that were compiled into a book uh, that were ended up being titled, The War That Will End War. World War I became known as this war that would end all wars. Obviously that's not the case, but the one that would is being fought in this garden. The war that will end all wars and it's gonna be fought by prayer on his face. Listen to his prayer. Abba, Father. I read the most beautiful thing yesterday at a funeral. A funeral of one of our members, the, the grandmother. Uh, some of her journal entries were found, and she was a believer. And in the last months of her life and her struggle, they had put it down on a piece of paper, her prayers, and they were so vulnerable and honest. She talked about her struggles and her fears, begging the Lord to help her not pity herself, but she's always been faithful to her. And you could see on this page her pour out her heart before the Lord is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I think it's just a glimpse yesterday that I saw of the Lord Jesus and what he experienced in the garden for our behalf. And the Lord is gracious to let me see that, that our Lord has become weak, has become poor, that we might have salvation. In the days of his flesh, Hebrews chapter five, verse seven, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications, listen to this, with loud cries and tears. You ever prayed like this? God help. Loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. But listen to this. He was heard because of his reverence. He was heard. And he would go and die, but the father was going to raise him from the dead. And we see in Jesus' war something very clearly. Man, prayer is the means by which the will of man is brought supernaturally under submission to the will of the father. And it's the only way is drawing from the power of the Lord and having no portion of his will left surrendered. Jesus gets up in this garden and he makes a beeline for the cross where he's gonna bear this wrath. And guys, this is again, this is the gospel. This is why we're here. This is why our hearts should well up in joy at the incarnation is for these kinds of moments in scripture. Jesus died for sinners. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Do you follow him? Have you surrendered everything to him? Because he will not take less. But if you would believe in him and trust his work, man, he would grant you grace because he's paid for it. He's paid for it at the cross. Jesus is the founder of our faith through his humanity, through his war, through drinking this cup, through being raised up from the dead. This is how he founds our salvation. And he says, come partake with me. Come take of the spoils of war. I'm gonna share them. That's amazing. But it doesn't stop there. He's also our perfecter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24 with me. 
Listen to this. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. So what this means is, Jesus is not just the founder of our salvation. He's not just done all this already. I mean, that would be crazy enough. He's bought us salvation, but he has left us an example that when we believe in him, we receive his grace, we receive the forgiveness of sins, we have his life as the pattern for victory that we also can pursue by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, this text and its beauty, I just wanna read the rest so we again hear these truths, verse 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Listen, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Amen. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, but I'm not just pulling this idea that he gives us a pattern out of Hebrews. I'm pulling this out of this text in verse 37 and 38. Read this with me. It says, he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. (laughs) Jesus is telling these guys, listen, if you don't do what I'm doing, you're gonna fall away. And he says it to us. Because in verse 50, they fail. In verse 50, it says they all fled and left him. We must follow the pattern of Jesus if we long to have victory. By his grace, by his spirit, yes, but his pattern. You know what's crazy again about this text? We find so much encouragement of the sympathy of the son of God towards us and his care for us. Jesus is in the darkest hour of his life. He is under an experience of agony like he has never experienced as an eternal being. And you know who he's concerned about? These guys. You know who's on his heart? You are. You know, we so often say, you know, I've got so much going on, I can barely take care of myself. (laughs) Look at this. He goes to the cross with us on his hearts. Those whom he paid for. That's unbelievable. Jesus lets this example in the garden. Listen, I at one point this week, I just had to... I had to take a bunch out or we're gonna be here like an hour and a half and I'm gonna spare you that. (laughs) Keep going. (laughs) There are so many things to pattern our lives after in this text of Jesus by his grace, whether it's positioning ourselves for obedience. I mean, he could have gone anywhere this night, but he went to the one place, the garden, where he knew he was gonna get betrayed and go to the cross. Whether it's his emotional vulnerability with his disciples. I mean, really, if anyone should have been putting on a, posi- a, a seeming attitude of strength, you'd think it'd be him and he sprawled out in the garden in front of his disciples. What, that means, what should that mean for us? I think it means that our self-image has to die. And until as a church, we embrace our weaknesses holistically across this place. As long as we put on strength, all we're gonna establish here is hypocrisy. This is Jesus, the son of God on his face in humanity, in weakness. We could see all these things, but I wanna focus really hard in on two. One, Jesus prayed himself clear in the garden. So must we. Jesus prayed himself clear. Anybody ever heard the phrase, leave it all out on the field? Ever heard that? He probably in a, especially a sports context. I remember growing up all the time I heard that. Hey, just go out there and leave it all on the field. Obviously not much is at stake. Nothing really is at stake at all except pride. But I think this is what happened in the garden. Exponentially greater. Is Jesus left no portion of himself unsurrendered. No portion. 
And it was accomplished through exhausting himself on his face in prayer to the Father, knowing that's the only way that this is gonna happen. And I think Jesus teaches us something really important right here. One, I've already mentioned it. Prayer is the means by which your will will be brought into submission to the Father's. We cannot muster up enough strength. We cannot change the will. I cannot convince you of anything of myself in this room right now. God, by his power, must turn our hearts by his hand. And Jesus is trust in this. And I think it's amazing what else is this teaching us. The greatest battles you likely will ever fight in your life will be ones that are totally engaged at the level of your mind. In the peacefulness of life before chaos hits. Jesus surrendering himself fully to the Father, amazing. Um, I want you to listen to John Piper on prayer. I think this describes Jesus' mission well. The number one reason why prayer malfunctions in the hands of a believer is that they try to turn a wartime walkie-talkie into a domestic intercom. Until you believe life is war, you cannot know what prayer is for. <clears throat> Prayer is accomplishment of wartime mission. Jesus knew, start to finish, his life was a declaration, an act of war against Satan and darkness. And we in his steps, by his victory and power, are in this fight. He's accomplished it, but we battle it by his power. And I guarantee you, I cannot convince you to pray in this room. I cannot. If you cannot be convinced that Jesus, if he the son of God needs the father in prayer, how much should we? I don't think anything's gonna convince you. But I'm gonna tell you this. Prayer is the means that God's kingdom will continually be drawn forward by drawing the power of heaven to earth because prayer is the area where we literally can't boast about anything because what are you doing besides laying yourself out and praying for mercy? It's the perfect position of weakness, and guess what? It's the perfect position of faith, and God loves to use our weakness. And I'll just leave you with this in terms of prayer. Jesus says, you can even pray with me an hour as if it's like the baseline commitment. I'll let you swallow that in. Jesus prays himself clear. I think we must also, by his grace, and I think, too, he remained alert until the end. Look at verses 37 through 40. Again, he came and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Again and again, they fall asleep. You remember what Jesus said last week in Mark 13? Four times at the end of the text, talking about his return, he says, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. And they're hitting the snooze button in 14. So many, I've heard so many people tell me over the years, and I struggle with the same things, I'm telling you. But I hear all the time, man, I just struggle to stay awake in prayer or stay focused. I struggle to, you know, in early in the morning to read my Bible and stay awake. Well, this is not new. They're in the presence of the Messiah and they can't stay awake. Like, are you kidding me? Like, he's right there. Have you seen what he's been doing all of Mark? Like, wake up. But they can. And I'm gonna tell you what, I think we learn again, Jesus is not fooled by the, this seeming peacefulness of life and nor should we be fooled. Nor should we be fooled to think this war is over. Sometimes there is not a war being waged for your soul, the souls of your children, the souls of your coworkers, the souls of your neighbors. All the while we have this beautiful message of reconciliation, of redemption. But everything seems fine. Everything seems quiet until they're gonna walk away several verses later. The garden is so interesting. And that I think we learn what we do in the midst of comfort is going to be directly linked to what you do when chaos hits. 
Don't you think you're gonna be able to handle it when it hits? You're gonna need to have prepared before. And so here's what I'm urging you to, and I will urge this until the day that I die. If we are not a people vested in the word of God and our Bibles on a day-to-day basis, if we're not vested in prayer, if we're not vested in scripture memory and letting the things of God soak in our persons, we will have no hope. We will have no hope for victory. I'm telling you, men hear me, especially. The greatest battles I believe you will fight in your life will be at 5 a.m. when no one else is awake in your house. When it's the middle of the night and no one else is awake, but you are laid out before the Lord seeking his mercy. But there's hope in all these things. This text ends in a tragic way. We know the story. Judas betrays him. The disciples flee. They begin to beat him in this false trial and condemn him to death. And then Peter at the end to put icing on the cake denies him and walks away but we know where Jesus is going. We know the hope. And I say to you today, this is a heavy text, but his grace and his mercy and his salvation is so much greater. And some of you today have been walking away from the Lord. You have walked away and you've been away from him a while. Man, but he will welcome you back to his grace like he welcomed Peter. If I could urge you to anything is the man, we see the greatness of Jesus Christ in this text. If you do not know him, I pray you would surrender yourself to him fully. Believe in him. Turn from your sin, believe in him. Look what he's accomplished for us. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you, Lord for the amazing truths of the cross, the amazing truths of humanity, of your son, of what he's bought for us, what he's done for us on our behalf. I pray it would not be lost on us after we walk out this door. Lord, I pray we would be filled with such a deepness of joy because of who you are and what you've done today and why, Father, this incarnation of your son is so critical for us because of these moments. Would you give us faith to trust you? Would you help us to pattern our lives after the victory of the son, of your son we find in this passage? Father, please continually draw us to yourself and make us holy. God, would you save in here? Would you bring salvation to someone in this room who does not know you. God, would you show them your worth? I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.